Hello and welcome to our brand new Historia podcast with me, Jack Pettit, and resident historian Paul Fletcher, nicknamed Fletch. This is the first episode of our new series on the Cold War. And this particular episode will set the scene. We'll look at the beginnings and end of the Second World War and how this ultimately morphs into the Cold War. So, Fletch, welcome. Thank you very much. So, such a huge topic to begin with. Um, let's just paint the picture. Um, where do we start? I think we'll start at the beginning, shall we? So, let's go back to September 1939. On the 1st of September 1939, Germany invaded Poland. Two days later, France and Britain declared war on Germany for that invasion. Most people are aware of that. What a lot of people don't realise is that two weeks after that declaration of war, Russia, the Soviet Union, actually invaded Poland as well. And as a result of that, Germany and Russia then divided up Poland, with Germany taking the western part and Russia taking the eastern part. Now this was possible because earlier in the year, the two countries had signed an alliance. And within that alliance, there was a secret bit which agreed to partition Poland. And that was the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. That's right. So actually you could say that by the end of 1939, Russia's behavior was actually against the interests of Britain. But Britain did not declare war on Russia, having done this, even though they declared war on Germany for doing exactly the same thing. Talking about invading Poland. Here. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> nothing very much happens. End of 1939. And in 1914, World War II. And then it all restarts in April 1940. And until and, then, it's the phony war. That's right, because there's nothing happening. From April 1940 through to June 1940, there are a series of stunning military successes for Nazi Germany, at which they defeat and dismantle the Western alliance, ending with the surrender of France, the British army being evacuated off the beaches of Dunkirk. And so by June 1940, you have Britain standing alone. As well as its empire, of course. Obviously supported by its empire, but no major allies. And that's due to Blitzkrieg, lightning war. That's right. That's right. Hitler then decided that he would, wanted to, invade and conquer Britain, and that obviously had to be done by an invasion. And as part of that, he first of all had to get control of the skies, leading to the Battle of Britain. That was obviously fought off in the summer of 1940, and then the Luftwaffe attempted to then bomb Britain into some sort of deal or surrender, uh, and of course we know that as the Blitz. By 1941, that had clearly failed. And at that point, Hitler decided to attack, really, the target he'd always wanted to attack, which was communist Soviet Union. And in June 1941, the Germans launched a surprise attack upon their supposed allies, called Operation Barbarossa. Four million troops attacked, catching the Soviet Union by complete surprise. So at this moment in time, Britain has no allies, Britain was alone. Of course, with that attack upon Soviet Union... Operation Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa. Four million. All, yep, four million. All of that changed. And the following month, I think it was the 12th of July, you get the signing of the Anglo-Soviet Agreement. And with this, Britain suddenly had an ally. And I think, really... To look at the terms of that is really, really important and instructive because what it actually said was that the two countries agreed to work together to cooperate to defeat Nazi Germany. Now, traditionally, Britain and Soviet Union were enemies and had, there was no love lost. And they are being driven together to work together because they had a bigger common enemy that was more threatening to either of them at that particular moment in time. 
So what's that saying? The, the enemy of my enemy, the enemy of your enemy is my friend. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So that therefore changed, but this, this situation, but at this moment in time, you can't talk about there being this thing called the Grand Alliance because, of course, America was still not involved in the war against Germany. America was still neutral. Now, Roosevelt wanted to help the president. He was helping as much as he could, but he was constrained, limited by very strict neutrality laws. All that changed when Japan attacked the American fleet at Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 1941. And some historians say that this is, good phrase, you know, the waking of a sleeping giant. Yes. Now, whether you agree with the Japanese decision or not, you can see that the Japanese gamble had a certain logic to it. However, what has no logic to it whatsoever, and what most people don't realize, is that, of course, America, when it declared war, in response to this attack, only declared war on Japan. At that moment in time, there was no war between Germany and the Americans. All that changed four days later when Hitler, without any apparent consultation with other leading figures in Nazi Germany, decided to declare war unilaterally on uh, America, on the USA. And with that, America responded with its own declaration of war upon um, Germany and also on Italy. And then I think it is possible for us to now begin to talk about this, this idea of the Grand Alliance. Now, the Grand Alliance means the big three, the USA, led by Roosevelt, the Soviet Union, led by Stalin, and Britain and its empire, led by Winston Churchill. When you normally have an alliance, an alliance is based around a treaty, but there is no treaty signed between those two, three, between those three, I should say. Sorry about that. And I suppose the closest we can get to it is New Year's Day 1942, when there is the United Nations Declaration in which all three countries pledge to work together to defeat Nazi Germany, Italy, and of course, Japan. So I suppose we can say that's the official start of this thing called the Grand Alliance. So <clears throat> what then happens is that the three countries work together to defeat those three powers. And one of the main ways they do it is by a series of uh, big conferences, three big conferences during the war, at which all three leaders are personally present. So we have one at Tehran in 1943, we have one at Yalta in February 1945, and we have one in Potsdam from July, August 1945 as well. And they're not just the only conferences? No, they're not the only conferences, but these are the three conferences where all three leaders turn up and they all meet each other in person and they discuss, well, it depends on what stage of the war we're up to. So they just, just decide you know, how to fight the war, how to win the war, and then as we get later on, certainly towards Potsdam, were then also they were looking at how do we run the world post World War II? Because by then, of course, Germany had been defeated. So, <clears throat> OK, by Potsdam, Germany had been defeated. Um, let's connect it now. Start and now end of World War II, link into the beginnings of the Cold War. How can we make that connection? OK, well... I think really one has to see the start of the Cold War as the breaking down of that Grand Alliance, okay? Because effectively the, the Grand Alliance was these three working together for an objective. The Cold War is two of those three then ending up as the enemy of one of those three, i.e. Britain and the USA becoming the enemy of the Soviet Union or vice versa. Historians differ on exactly when we can say the Cold War begins. Some argue 1947, some argue 1948. Um, but I think whatever you actually see as the official starting point, what we can all agree on is that the period between the summer of 1945 to that start date, the Grand Alliance begins to break down, it begins to dissolve, work doesn't be, work properly anymore, and that is 
how we get from the Cold War, sorry, we get from World War II to the Cold War. Now, I would see effectively two links between World War II and the Cold War. The first link is, of course, with the ending of World War II, that removes the glue that holds the Grand Alliance together. Because, of course, as I said before, right from the beginning, what holds the Alliance together is the need to defeat the enemy. In particular, the need to defeat um, Nazi Germany. Driven more by that than it is by the need to defeat Japan in some ways. So once that has been achieved, actually, there is no need for the Grand Alliance. And all those things that divided them before there was a Grand Alliance, then they rise to the surface and become much more important. And we have to remember that those countries were traditionally enemies. Britain and the USA had both supported the White Army when they had fought the communists in the Russian Civil War in the 1920s. The USA had even refused to recognize the Soviet Union as an official country until 1933. These tensions ran deep. So we could say that the Grand Alliance during World War II was a blip in relations. Yes. They got better because of the a common enemy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And almost, therefore, I think it's fair to argue that after World War II, they revert to the enmity that was there before. But the difference this time is that whereas in the past you have the Soviet Union way over there, you have the Americans way over there, what World War II did was it brought them physically right up to each other. Because, of course, Eastern Europe and Eastern Germany had been physically liberated by the Red Army, and likewise, Western Europe had been physically, and Western Germany, had been physically liberated by the Americans and the British. And so, therefore, at the end of the war, you have the armies of both countries literally facing each other. Yeah, very famous, isn't it, when the the meeting of the Soviet and the American troops on River Elbe. Yes. Very famous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what that meant is that for the first time, you have those two powers, those two great superpowers, the USSR and the USA, in direct contact with each other and effectively direct competition with each other. And that is why the situation in Europe had changed so much by as a result of World War II. And it is that direct connection and that direct, if you like, uh, competition that will end up uh, happening. That is effectively why the Cold War happened after 1945. And the enmity that had been there previously became something very, very different. Fletch, thank you so much. Um, First episode, brilliant set in the scene. Join us next time for what is our second episode looking at the conferences in particular, we're going to look at Yalta. So thanks, Fletch. Thanks very much.